Welcome, my name is Matteo, and I am part of Group 7 in History 111b. Our final project topic focuses on women who left an indelible mark on the Ottoman Empire. Our investigation delves into the lives and contributions of prominent sultanas, including Horem Sultan, Kosem Sultan, Safiye Sultan, and Turhan Sultan. Additionally, we explore the intriguing stories of Sayyid al Hura, the Pirate Queen, and Lady Mary Wortley Montague. Presented in the form of a podcast, we deliver 10 unique stories about some of the most interesting and influential women in Ottoman history. We hope you enjoy. Hello, my name is Brianna Aryampour, and my subtopic of a woman's role in the Ottoman Empire is about Safiye Sultan's life, role, and impact within the Ottoman Empire, in addition to her wielding political power within the Ottoman government. Safiye Sultan is easily known as one of the most influential women of this time period for various reasons. Her affiliation in both foreign and domestic politics made an impact on the Ottoman government like no other. She would affiliate herself with higher powers, including Queen Elizabeth, and her letters can be studied as they mention the diplomatic ties between the empires and just how well connected Safiye could be. However, her mind did not simply sit idly by and write letters. Safiye created an interconnected system of power through the harem walls. The book titled Gender Domains, Rethinking Public and Private in Women's History by Dorothy Helley and Susan Reverby further elaborates on this by explaining that women were deemed part of the private sphere, particularly the harem, in which Safiye, despite her limited capability of being constrained to the walls of the harem, still found a way to create a network of power and influence within the policies of the empire, including domestic and foreign affairs. This shows Safiye's resilience and how she used her connection of being the wife of Sultan Murad III to her advantage to gain political popularity. As the wife of a sultan, she had traditional roles to follow as well, such as creating heirs and being a good wife to her husband. She performed these roles so adequately that the sultan favored her the most out of all of his concubines and wives. In addition to these roles, she was a great contributor when it came to political policies, gaining further favor from Sultan Murad III. Safiye's influence on Ottoman policies helped it become the great empire was expanding lands and making connections no one else could. Overall, her influence is talked about and studied to this day, and her role in government affairs is seen as extraordinary. Hello there, my name is Lauren Davies, and I will be discussing the fascinating life of Saida al Hara. Saida al Hara was born in Granada sometime between 1491 and 1495. But due to the Christian Europeans' crusade against the Muslims residing there, she and her family were forced to flee to Morocco when she was a child. Around 1510, Saida al Hara married the governor of Tetuan, and nine years later, after her husband's death, she took over as governor of the city in Morocco's northern frontier. She governed Tetuan for 30 years, and it is evident from what she accomplished and who she associated with that she was a special woman. Saida al Hara is called by some a pirate, which could come from the fact that she controlled a large navy, commanded the pirates in her region who terrorized Spanish and Portuguese ships, and had an alliance with the famous corsair Barbarossa. She developed a reputation as a protector of her people against Iberian occupation. Additionally, she was the person that Europeans went to to negotiate for the release of Christian prisoners. Because of this, she became quite wealthy due to ransom money. To consolidate power in northern Morocco, in 1541, Saida al-Hara married the Sultan of Morocco, Moulay Ahmad al-Watasi. Unheard of at the time, the Sultan traveled to Saida al-Hara and Tetuan for their marriage, rather than in the capital of Fez, where other royal marriages had taken place. However, after nearly 30 years of holding power in Tetuan, Saida al-Hara was displaced by her son-in-law in 1542. Some may try to embellish her life and make her out as a swashbuckling pirate. However, in reality, her life needs no embellishment. What makes her so fascinating is that in a world dominated by men, Saida al Hara was able to build and wield significant political and economic power. Hi, my name is Jane Heiss, and next up we explore the impact and legacy of Kosem Sultan, one of the most fascinating women to reign within the Ottoman Empire. 
In order to fully understand the magnitude of Kosem's influence, I turn to the essence of leadership theory. Despite the patriarchal nature of the Ottoman Empire, influential women often rose to power through very distinct and cunning political maneuvers. Leadership theory suggests that confidence and tactful decision-making skills make for authoritative leaders, and Kosem certainly exuded these distinct qualities. On Kosem's path to power, she first began as the head of the imperial harem an undeniably critical piece to her reign as it brought her closer to the sultan and created a place for her in the fold of Ottoman leadership. After her marriage to Ahmed I, she gave birth to many children, including the future Sultan Ibrahim I, and from there her sovereignty flourished. Once Sultan Ibrahim I fell ill and became unable to fulfill his governing duties, she boldly took hold of the government as regent of the sultan. Her resolute passion for power thus disproves the commonly peddled notion that the Ottoman Empire did not allow for imperial leadership composed of women. Kosem remained a vital part of the Ottoman central leadership for 30 years, and directly serves as regent of the sultan for 10 years. In fact, throughout her time as deputy ruler, she skillfully navigated issues of administrative bureaucracy and citizen unrest, keeping the Ottoman Empire afloat and operating as its primary leader. This certainly explains diplomatic reverence towards Ottoman women. Ambassadors from foreign countries all over Europe understood the reputation and significance of imperial women like Gosem, further proving the Ottoman women absolutely played a part in the empire's long political history. Turhan Sultan was born around 1627 and was of Rus origin. At a young age, she was captured in one of the raids of the Tatars and sold into slavery. After being captured, she was presented to the palace as a gift to Kosem Sultan. She was groomed by Kosem, who presented Turhan to her son, Ibrahim I, who was the sultan at the time. At this age, Turhan was described as tall, delicate, had blue eyes, and was white-skinned. On January 2, 1642, Turhan gave birth to the future sultan, Mehmed IV. Despite giving Ibrahim his first son, she was largely ignored by him. On August 8, 1648, Ibrahim was dethroned and soon after strangled due to his bad behavior. Turhan's son was next in line to become the sultan, which left Turhan in the position to become Valide Sultan. However, Turhan was overlooked due to her young age and lack of experience, and Qasem Sultan once again returned to power. Turhan Sultan was unhappy about this, to put it lightly, and eventually was involved in the murder of Qasem Sultan. On the night of September 2nd, 1651, Kosem Sultan was murdered. However, when Turhan came to power, the Ottoman Empire was in a pretty bad political and financial situation due to the Cretan War against Venice. Due to her lack of experience, Turhan handed over power to Koprulu Mehmed Aga, who became the Grand Vizier. Koprulu agreed to become Grand Vizier on the condition that he had full political power. This effectively marked the end of the Sultanate of Women. Despite this, Turhan still had significant influence in the Ottoman Empire and was the patron for many architectural feats such as the Yeni Kami, or the New Mosque, which was completed under her supervision. This is where Turhan Sultan would end up being buried alongside her son Mehmed IV after her death on August 4, 1683. Hello, my name is Adler Kirsten and my subtopic revolves around the life and impact of Nurbanu Sultan. Delving into Nirbana's early life, charitable endeavors, and her overall aptitude for politics, this presentation will demonstrate the momentous influence that Nirbano Sultan had within the Ottoman dynasty. Born Cecilia Vineyard Bafo in 1525, she was born as an illegitimate daughter of two Venetian noble families. At the tender age of 12, Nirbano Sultan was captured by the Admiral-in-Chief of the Ottoman Navy, where she entered the Ottoman harem of Prince Salim in Constantinople. Her political and administrative career began as early as 1542, where she was chosen as the favorite concubine, or Haseki, of the Crown Prince Salim. A member of Salim's seraglio, Nirbanu's authority would significantly increase after 1562, where her son Murad was singled out as the Crown Prince, and further still after 1571, the year she became the legal wife of Sultan Salim II. By 1574, the year her son Murad III became Sultan, Nirbanu officially took on the bespoken title of Valid Sultan, or Queen Mother, holding the highest office of the imperial haram until her untimely death in 1583. The time of Nirbanu Valid Sultan corresponds to the late 16th century, where the structure of the Ottoman dynasty, as well as the relations between the members of the dynasty, was undergoing a profound change. 
Towards the end of the 16th century, the paradigm underwent a dramatic shift as the access to royal women to grand acts of patronage and rewards accrued to them as a result allowed for women like Nirvana to immortalize their glory and overall benevolence. Through the construction of the imperial mosque complex, otherwise known as the Atik Valid, Nirbanu not only elevated her stature in Ottoman political and social circles, but provided the dynasty with much-needed displays of pomp and support. As denoted by historian Pinar Kayap Altkan, the Atik Valid served not only to immortalize Nirbanu's old prestige, but to amplify the magnificence of her husband and son's legacy. Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Brown, and I'll be talking about Fatima Hatun or formerly known as Beatrice Mashiach, and her role as a renegade woman in Benito Ottoman relations. In the latter half of the 16th century, Hatun fled an unhappy marriage of Venice for Constantinople, where she would convert to Islam, remarry, and change her name to Fatima. With this move and her familial ties to the imperial haram because of her brother Gazanfer, she played a huge role in using this in-between status that she had to act as a spy. She did this because her sons had still lived in Venice at the time. She wanted to protect them, but she also remained somewhat committed to the Venetian state that financially supported her and her family. While being involved in the Imperial Haram, she also financially supported a number of Venetian religious and charitable institutions. We noticed that it is rare to find a convert to Islam not lose their status in Christianity, but she was clearly exempt because she had reached an important position in the Ottoman Empire. And the Venetians did not look at it as if those who converted from Islam lost their status in Christianity, but rather just high-ranking people belonging to another religion, which was something that they saw that they could take advantage of and use towards their benefit. Nevertheless, she played a key role for about a decade in intending the imperial palace and the haram while openly acting in favor of the Venetians. Ultimately, Fatima Hatun acted as a renegade woman because she was able to subordinate societal and cultural mentalities and structures while navigating the political and religious frontiers of the Mediterranean as a means of freeing herself from circumstances that women usually had limited powers to act upon. Hello, my name is Jonathan Terrell and I'll be delving into the fascinating world of Lady Mary Wortley Montague and her numerous significant contributions to documenting Ottoman history. Lady Mary was a trailblazer in every sense of the word. As a traveler, she was most remarkable for being the very first to document the Ottoman Empire from a Western female lens, during a time when it was unconventional for women to travel. Because of this, her accounts had a keen focus on the women of the Ottoman Empire, which is also very unprecedented as the male travelers who came before her generally had a much different emphasis. After the death of Lady Mary, her descendants, most notably Lord Warncliffe, performed the honorable task of compiling all of her letters and works from her lifetime and publishing them as a complete collection. The most notable of these works are the Turkish Embassy Letters, in which Lady Mary gives her accounts on everything from day-to-day -day practices by ordinary Ottoman citizens to the opulent and exotic world of the Ottoman court, offering a contrast to the much more restrained and formal society of 18th century England. Lady Mary's letters had already made an impact back home, as her account of the visits uh, to the ladies of the Grand Vizier were featured in a 1763 segment of the British Gentleman's Magazine, which is one of the very first general interest magazines in England, uh, founded about two decades prior. These letters also proved to be deeply impactful to historians and have sparked endless scholarly conversations and criticism around them. On one side of the coin, scholars such as Lisa Lowe and Critical Terrains have argued that these letters were impressively progressive, inclusionary, and ahead of their time. Some would even call it an embodiment of proto-feminist ideals. On the other hand, some scholars have criticized Lady Mary for engaging in Orientalist discourses and not being concerned with presenting the truth as much as a masquerade. I would argue that no matter your standpoint on Lady Mary's intentions, it has to be acknowledged that her impacts on the studies of Ottoman-European interactions have been immeasurable and her contributions as a travel writer and cultural commentator have secured her a lasting place in our history. Thank you. The conversation of women in the Ottoman Empire wouldn't be complete without discussion of Lady Mary Wortley Montague's transformative impact on healthcare, notably her groundbreaking introduction and popularization of smallpox inoculation. Directly inspired by her Ottoman travels, she intimately encountered and documented this practice, advocating it upon her return to England. In the 17th and 18th centuries, smallpox was a prevalent and deadly concern, causing frequent epidemics and emerging as a major cause of death in Britain. 
Influenced by personal experiences with smallpox, Lady Mary championed inoculation, challenging social skepticism and medical conservatism. During Lady Mary's travels, she wrote the Turkish Embassy Letters, a collection detailing her experiences and observations on the culture, society, and customs of the Ottoman Empire. Within one of her letters, Lady Mary not only details the Ottoman method for preventing smallpox, known as inoculation or engrafting, but also expresses her explicit intent to bring this practice back to England. This letter highlights Lady Mary's engagement with the practice of inoculation within Ottoman society, challenging traditional gender roles and emphasizing her influential role in the cross-cultural exchange of medical knowledge. Lady Mary's efforts bringing the practice of inoculation back to England are well documented in a collection of letters addressed to the Countess of Mar. The letters include various accounts of inoculation within her social circles that Lady Mary is directly responsible for. These letters offer insight into Lady Mary's proactive advocacy, showcasing her personal application of the practice within her community and her contributions to its growing popularity. Lady Mary's advocacy for inoculation shines through her active political participation and robust defense in writings, shaping public perception amidst the resistance from medical and religious communities. Lady Mary also benefited from her elevated societal position marked by wealth and aristocracy, which played a pivotal role in shaping and amplifying her impact. Lady Mary Montague's historical narrative reveals her as an initiator and advocate in introducing smallpox inoculation to England. Engaging in public discourse, strategic political involvement, and personal application within her community, she emerged as a pivotal figure reshaping healthcare in the 18th century. Her transformative journey through the Ottoman Empire played a crucial role in bringing this innovative medical practice to England, leaving an enduring legacy in public health. A woman who had an immense effect on the Ottoman Empire and the way in which people from other parts of the world understood it was Julia Pardot. She was born in England in 1806, and her father was an officer who traveled to the Ottoman Empire for his work. In 1835, she accompanied him and was fascinated by life in this foreign place. She wrote multiple volumes on her travels, and one in particular that stands out is called The City of the Sultan and Domestic Manner of the Turks in 1836. She gave detailed accounts of her daily experiences and encounters, including architecture, wildlife, clothing, hospitality, prayer, weddings, and social dynamics. This both intrigued and enlightened her primarily European audience, who had preconceived notions of the Ottoman Empire and often romanticized and fetishized the harems and the women. In chapter 7 of her book, Julia Pardo is given access to the imperial harem. She describes the room and the social dynamics. She emphasizes the social rigidity among the women and how the wife of the sultan is expected to be obeyed and served by the rest, regardless of whether other women may be preferred by the sultan. In chapter 2, she also conveyed the importance of hospitality in Ottoman society. It is considered an honor to host guests, and it is one's moral duty to take in any guests that approach, regardless of wealth or status. She discusses this because their core belief is that they are caretakers of all on behalf of God, and the possessions that they own are not truly theirs, and it is their duty to share with those who have less. As seen in this section, Pardo speaks highly of the Ottoman Turks and truly understands their values, and seeks to convey this to her fellow Europeans. This is important because during this time, it was common for Western people to other Eastern civilizations, and many viewed the Ottoman Turks as warmongering people who had unenlightened barbaric tendencies. Pardo's account combats this commonly held notion, and she uses her first-hand experiences to elicit a positive view of the Ottomans through detailing her experiences and treatment at their hands. Hey, it's Matteo again, and my subtopic is about the life and legacy of Horem Sultan. Horem Sultan, also known as Roxelana, was one of the most unique and influential figures in the Ottoman Empire, born between 1502 and 1506 in Ruthenia, now western Ukraine, she was kidnapped by Crimean Tartar slave traders during a raid on her village. She was taken to the slave market in Istanbul and purchased as a servant for the sultan's granddaughter. It was there she was given the Persian name Harem, which means the cheerful one. Around the age of 15, she was purchased by the sultan's mother and made a concubine for the recently crowned sultan Suleiman. Harem charmed Suleiman, known for her red-haired beauty, cheerful personality, intellect, and love of poetry. She soon became the sultan's favorite. Harem Sultan broke the mold of a concubine in many ways. First, she bore Suleiman multiple sons. In Ottoman custom, after the first son was born, the mother would leave the capital and take charge of her son's upbringing 
while the king took on a new concubine. Instead, she stayed with the sultan and remained in the capital even when her sons left. Second, she married the sultan, a rarity in her time. She was one of the first concubines to become an empress. She left the harem and resided in an apartment next to the king's chamber, giving her influence in politics and matters of state. She wielded tremendous influence, particularly in diplomacy. For example, she was instrumental in securing a Polish-Ottoman alliance. In fact, letters between her and the Polish king Zygmunt II still remain. They are one of the few primary sources left of Harim Sultan. Given a huge allowance, she also engaged in a wide array of charity work. She founded and built mosques, soup kitchens, and a women's hospital. Harim died in her 50s of sickness, and following her death, Sultan Suleiman became morbid and deeply depressed before dying eight years later. Today, Harim is remembered as a strong female figure who, despite the odds, rose to the pinnacle of power for a woman in the Ottoman Empire. She also inadvertently ushered in a new era of the rule of sultanas. For the next century, the Sultanate of Women, made up of the wives and mothers of sultans, exercised more political and social influence than women ever had before or since in the Ottoman Empire. Thank you so much for listening. Our bibliography and sources are in the description below.